so in the previous lecture it was basically a overview of um, hardcore model phase transitions we said that you know you start with the general idea that phase transitions are interesting to study a typical uh, system showing phase transition is a solid on heating becomes liquid which becomes gas these transitions are typically first order transitions and so it seems interesting to understand the first order transitions and not only focus on the critical phenomena which occurs only at the end point of transition so then you can ask that okay these are first order transitions there is a jump in density and then what else is there to discuss so i have my aim in these lectures is to show that different first order transitions look like each other in some way and they differ from each other in some other way okay so that is there is a fair amount of richness in the phenomena which we would have liked to understand uh, a priori but there is a complication as well it seems that the transition from the order to disordered phase solid to liquid or whatever it is called can sometimes depend on the shape of the molecules and sometimes you don't get one phase transition from solid to liquid but you get a transition sequence of transitions which are called intermediate phases meso phases liquid crystals there are different types of liquid crystals nematic smectic a smectic b and i think people have managed to produce um, materials which undergo a sequence of nine transitions from solid to liquid in uh, bengaluru <laughs> okay so that's not so i'm just pointing out that there is some interesting things which one can try to understand so in this lecture my aim is sort of more um computational with the aim is to let you get familiar with some basic techniques which are used in understanding various systems in statistical physics we'll use them in the context of hardcore models but the techniques have wide applicability okay so let me start with the first one So this is so I consider uh, we will consider a lattice lattice gas. for the moment we'll take it to be square lattice you can generalize this technique to other things fairly immediately and we'll take a gas which is uh, nearest neighbor exclusion okay so here is the lattice and i take some particle here and then the you can try you can imagine that the system has a size which is like this so these particles like hard squares which cover um, this diamond like objects so that and they are non overlapping so you cannot put another one here but you can put one here okay so this site excludes this one and this one and this one and this one not visible okay bigger figures 
or I want to, you want me to shift to that side. Okay, just be, oh, I see, I should stand here. So if you occupy this side, you cannot put another particle on top of this over here, over here, over here, over here. That is the constraint. So if the density of such objects is low, let us say 0 0.01, then you have particles uh, spread all over space. Uh, and there is not much interaction between them. So they are like uh, ideal gas, you know, they are all over. But if the density becomes high, then they start interacting. And then there is a, what is the maximum possible density I can get in this gas? It is half. Because you can just al occupy alternate sites, one sub lattice, and it will perfectly allowed configuration. And so it has a maximum density half. And uh, so I can define a partition function omega, which is a function of z, which is summation over configurations z to the power n, where n is the number of particles in the configuration. And so it depends on the configuration. Okay, all the configurations we are thinking of are allowed configurations, so we don't consider configurations which are forbidden. Okay, so this, of course, is a function of the size of the system, which will write below. And let us consider L by L lattice with periodic boundary conditions. Okay, so this one can then be written as, I write this series as the power series in Z. So I write 1 plus, there is a term corresponding to Z, and then there is a term corresponding to Z squared, and Z cubed, and so on. And the last term will be Z to the power L squared by 2, which is the maximum number of particles you can put. You cannot put more. OK? So if I take L equal to 4 by 4, you can explicitly write down this polynomial, or 10 by 10. Then maybe you get a computer to write down. OK? And then let's, can we understand the behavior of this system? So ideally, I'm supposed to take log omega v of z and take limit v goes to infinity and that gives me a quantity which I will call p of z, it is the pressure of the gas. This is the standard Gibbs formulation of stat mac and I am putting kt equal to 1. because the temperature is not a variable. So I just take log of omega to be the pressure. It is pressure up to units. OK, so, so this is what it is. And we would like to know what p of z is and uh, what I can determine are these functions. So let us write, so work out. work out omega of L cross L of Z in my problem here. And these are some numbers. So I'll call this N1, N2, N3, and Nn is equal to number of allowed configurations with exactly 
n particles. Okay, so now I want to write uh, with no particle there is only one configuration that is everything empty. If I only allow one particle then it can be on any of the L sites and so sorry L cross L sites so it is L squared Z. Then I want to write the second um, coefficient of Z squared that is the number of configurations on this L by L lattice with periodic um, torus which are allowed. So how many configurations are allowed on an L by L torus with two particles. So this calculation is done as follows. You say first particle I can put anywhere it is allowed. Next particle I can put into n minus 5 places. Okay, So the answer is L squared into L squared minus 5 by 2. The reason for the by 2 occurs because the first and second particle labels are arbitrary and you get the same configuration if you call, you double count. The way I did it, I double counted. So I fixed that. Okay. And then I write the coefficient corresponding to z cube. How do I calculate the coefficient of z cube? The same method. Take some configuration like this and there is an allowed configuration which is let us say something here. Then how many ways can I put the third particle? L squared minus 10 ways here because these are non overlapping. Okay, But I will have to worry if this particle is very close here then maybe the number is not 10 but 9. Okay, and closer it is different. But with a little bit of work, you can actually work out explicitly what is the coefficient of z cubed in this expansion. It is a counting problem. Okay, and uh, assuming that we can count correctly, so it, actually I have kind of indicated the proof at some level, but you will get an answer which I am just going to write down now schematically. Okay. So there is a term corresponding to L to the power 6 which roughly comes because you can put each particle in roughly L squared ways. And there are three of them, so it's L to the power 6. Actually, they were divided by 6. So let's put that 1 by 6 here. Then mm, there are configurations. This one is a correction term, so it is usually negative. It is because you overcounted. Sometimes you have to exclude some configuration, so there'll be a and then maybe you overcount that one, and this is a second correction. And so on. I will not work them out here. Okay, but this series is not a very nice series if you stare at it because this is one, this is L squared Z. Even when Z is small, I am supposed to take L goes to infinity limit. And then this first term contributes more than the zeroth term, and the second term contributes more than the first term, and so on. So it looks like even at low density, this series is not particularly useful. Okay, So that is the main thing we have to do is to realize that what I would like to do, I will like to consider log omega of z and I realize or I postulate or I can show but for the moment we will take it as a fact and that this is actually a series which has the form L squared into A1z plus A2z squared ok. So what it says is that I know that in my problem this log omega v 
if I take, it is proportional to the volume. This will not happen for all arbitrary functions you can tailor expand into power series, but for my power series plus uh, correction terms um, for small l. Okay. So I postulate this and then I write the I write this series one plus b one uh, one plus yeah let us say one plus b one l squared z plus b2 l4 plus b3 l squared z squared plus b4 or z cubed order z4 as equal to exponential of L squared and we have written A1z plus A2z squared plus A3z cubed plus higher order terms and then I expand this exponential and compare term by term. Okay. So the first term is 1 in both that is working. Second term is I should get b1 l squared z is equal to a1 l squared z. So b1 must be equal to a1. Okay. And then I look at this is order z term, order z squared. So in the here you get b2 l4 plus b3 l square. In the right hand side, when you expand this, you will get equal to a2 l squared from here, but you also get a term which comes from when you square this and divide by 2. So this will be plus a1 squared L squared by 4 by 2. So sorry, yes, A1 squared is good, L4 here, second one is 4, yeah sorry, okay. So now I already know what is b1 and a1 and b2 we have determined and it should be a1 squared by 4. It is not a new number, it is the same old function. So roughly I can um, determine a2 from this equation because the l4 terms will cancel by themselves and l squared terms will survive and then I get b2 in terms, a2 in terms of b2. And then when I look at the third order term, I'll get A3 in terms of B3 and B1 and B2. Okay. So all the A1, A2, A3 can be determined recursively. They are finite numbers. They don't have any L dependence. Okay. And that is the key point. Yes. So we are considering involving that in the Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it is possible to show that if you take model with short range interactions, then the free energy will have this L squared form very generally without going into the details of the interaction. So I know that this postulate I made here is good for a very wide class of interactions. 
they should be just short range their integral you know they, their integral should be converging or some such thing and then all this will work okay so i can determine determine b1 b2 sorry determine a1 a2 a3 in terms of b1 b2 b3 recursively what this means is that you you can say there is infinite number of variables here infinite number of variables there how am i going to solve them but you can solve them one by one if i determine a1 then determine a2 then determine a3 then determine a4 and till y okay very good so that is the mayer series now with this series log omega z is this so then i can write density so let us do that point so this now this will be called the mayer second series but before that so this fact that you know when you take the log of this expression or you in some books one says take the log of this and you write this you know then you take a formal log but that sounds very unconvincing because you know this series um, here it's the stuff you are taking log of is very big and you know the taylor expansion for the very big stuff is not really working and so instead one says that take this and exponentiate this and compare with this that is a much cleaner argument okay the first one is justified by taking a formal comparison by powers of z something something but you know you can just say that take this series and ex this should exponentiate to this and we check that it works when a1 a2 a3 are these numbers okay very good Huh. Ah, so this one will be a1 squared by 2 b2 will have to be a1 squared by 2 yeah this will be this is a necessary condition for the series to converge or for this mayer expansion to work so automatically it will be like that it will be like that yes yeah and and like from that expansion we can evaluate it like b1 and b1 like, like yeah if we compare the upper and yeah yeah of, yeah so you can work these out this and compare the yeah 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 precisely so i am saying that b1 b2 b3 are determined by explicit counting okay once you have determined b1 b2 b3 you can determine a1 a2 a3 which are slightly more subtle but they have the property that they don't depend on l anymore okay b1 b2 b3 didn't depend on l but the full series dependent on l in some complicated way yes sir yes of course yeah 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 no 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 there is a logical argument which says that we are imposing that we know that this structure happens that for large l log omega l will have a series expansion where l squared is the dominant term and stuff inside looks like this and using this well behavior condition we are determining the values of a1 a2 a3 okay yeah uh so the correction for small l come from the fact that this series form will not well work for l equal to 2 for large l the number will be exactly written as a polynomial in l but for small l it will not have this form so you you know you should first say say that l is large but finite and this form is exact and then i compare it with this to determine the b's 
So now I have got log omega z over n. Let us call the small omega of z. Uh, I actually like to call it we write it like this omega of z to the power 1 by n equal to omega z log. Okay, it's just that I'm defining in the omega to be the partition function per site. Instead of free energy per site, I'm taking the exponential of the free energy per site to be the partition function per site. Okay, so this one is written as a1z plus a2z squared plus a3z cubed plus it's a series. And in good cases, it can be shown that this series actually converges. It has a finite radius of convergence. While the original Mayer series, there was not much hope of it having a radius of convergence as a function of z. OK, but now I'm not very sure. Uh, this is called p of z, no? Yeah, this is called p of z, pressure as a function of z is the pressure of the lattice gas. OK, now d log omega z by dz z is called the density as a function of z. Density is the number of particles per site. So this I can evaluate because this is a series. And I can take just the derivative zd by dz gives me the rho z series. So this will be a1z plus 2a2z squared because zd by dz pulls out a power of n 3a3z cubed plus. Okay. So now there is this general technique that if you are given f as a series of x, g is equal to another series of x with some coefficients, you know. So this will be a1, a2, a3, this is b1. These b's are not the same as the other b's. This is just two power series. Then, when x is small, g is also small. Okay, so I can write f is equal to g plus g squared plus g cubed okay. You can say I eliminate x between these two and f becomes a function of g. Okay, and can we expand this now as a power series? The point is, is that this series can be written down again by inspection or by sort of recursively working out. Suppose g is very small, then fx is equal to a1x, gx is equal to b1x, so this will be b1 by a1, sorry, a1 by b1. You work to order x, then g is equal to b1x and f is equal to a1x, then f is equal to a1 by b1g. Then you work to order x squared. Then this can be truncated here and g is this expression, put that in here or rather, yeah, so this will be this plus g squared, okay? And so this can be inverted, this series can be inverted. So we will write it c1, c2, c3. And this series for c is explicit and it can be worked out in terms of my series b1, b2, b3. And this one is sort of interesting because express p 
of z as p of rho. So this series is now called the virial series because it expresses p is equal to rho plus rho squared plus rho cubed. And all these operations are linear operations in the coefficients. Okay, so you will get the coefficients of this series which will be linear functions of b1, b2, b3 and all that stuff. Okay, so that is a very useful general technique. It's called the virial expansion technique. Okay, very good. So, so usually this is p is equal to rho is the first term and then this is the first virial coefficient, second virial coefficient and so on. Okay, now done. So now we will sort of imitate Ohnsager and use the Mayer series to calculate the virial expansion for long roads. Okay, however, before we do that, it is helpful to consider some um, sort of practice problems. Yes. Okay, so, so firstly, if you keep to order x, then the, the f is a series which is linear in A, no, it will be A. Now, A2 will be determined in terms of B2, right, and so on. I think the denominators, I should just put A1 equal to B1. Then the answers are cleaner. C1 is also 1. In the series we study, usually both of them start with x. If they don't, you just multiply one of them by something and then they start with x. Then this thing can be written as g squared already. So b2 equal to a, c2 equal to a2, that kind of stuff. So it, it works recursively. At higher order, some things you have to subtract. They are not identical, but they are very similar, similarly related. It's a good exercise to work this out, this elimination of variables in a series expansion. You take your favorite functions f and g and eliminate. So for example, even if g is a simple function like this, now if you write x in terms of g, you will have square roots. And then you will have square roots and you know expansions in power of square roots. It looks a bit messy. But iteratively, the series is easy to work out, easier than substituting the full solution and working it out. Okay. Okay, so practice problems. The first problem we would like to do, because we are going to study something in two dimensions, one should at least work out what are hard particles on a line in one dimension. So I have a line of length L and I have particles, but they have finite size. The size is sigma and you cannot have overlapping particles. And um, I want to write omega N is equal to omega N of L is equal to integral dx1, integral dx2, integral dx3, dxn. Uh, we will take x1 less than x2 less than xn, 0 to L. And there is this function 1, which is the indicator function for allowed functions and 0 for others. 
So it's a simple exercise to do this integral, but it's a multidimensional integral. And so how to do it? So there is a standard trick which works here, which is that you define the spacings, delta 1, delta 2, delta 3. This is the nth particle. There is a delta n plus 1. OK? So delta i is equal to xi plus 1 minus xi minus sigma. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, this is good for i greater delta 1 equal to x1 minus sigma by 2 and for i bigger than 1 this is true and I will take delta of n plus 1 equal to l this is the last there is no particle here but I imagine uh, L plus sigma by 2. Okay, then uh, this integral in terms of delta becomes integral d delta 1, d delta 2, d delta n plus 1. Sorry, there are only n variables, so d, d delta n. Um, and then the condition is x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus xn is xn is less than equal to L minus n sigma. Okay. And so this can be done. So this is, you know, you have to do it geometrically in three dimensions. This is something like the volume of a tetrahedron. In four dimensions is the volume of a four dimensional tetrahedron. Okay? And so this becomes L minus N sigma to the power N plus 1 over N plus 1 factorial. Sorry? The condition. Huh. Oh, yeah, sorry, I beg your pardon. Delta 1 plus delta 2 plus delta n plus one, delta n is less than, okay? So now, this is very easy because I can take the log, log omega n l d by d l gives me the pressure. Okay, because this is the this is the entropy actually, because it's just the number of configurations gives me the pressure, and this goes as one upon L minus n sigma n for large n. And so this pressure, so this can be written as one upon L minus sigma. L is equal to L by N is equal to mean spacing per particle. Which is 1 by rho. Okay, so it can also be written as rho over 1 minus sigma rho. And so if you plot P as a function of rho, the maximum value is 1 by sigma. And the graph looks like that. Okay. Uh, there is another way of doing this problem, which is actually instructive and useful, which I will indicate but not do in full detail. So you define, don't do this calculation in this ensemble, which was the canonical ensemble but do it in a constant pressure ensemble, okay? So, constant pressure ensemble is defined by Z of P 
P is equal to integral dl zl of n e to the power minus beta pl. So this is the partition function of n particles on a line of length l and I multiply it by e to the power minus pl because that is the probability that the extent of the system is up to L. There is a pressure and so there is a energy PL and beta PL is the weight of that configuration. So in the constant pressure ensemble value of L is not fixed but it is weighted by this factor and then I sum over all DL. Okay. So in this case there is a beta PL so this becomes um, this, uh, I will not do the full calculation here. Here, the constraint that, here the, there was a constraint that all the deltas have to add up to something, you know, here. This constraint is no longer there. And the integrals over delta 1, delta 2, delta 3 are independent variables. They just multiply. So this becomes more or less equal to integral d delta i e to the power minus beta p delta i minus beta p sigma. Okay. And so it can be worked out and it gives you the same answer in the end. But you know, it, now this is in p. You get the pressure directly. Um, but L, which is the mean length, is now the, the determined variable, dependent variable. Here P is the independent variable, L is the dependent variable. In the previous calculation, the L was given and P was determined. These are just different ensembles. But here, this one is easier. To, there is a one last integral which comes from the L plus one -th, N plus one -th integral, which is slightly different. But let's not okay so we have done this one same result as before so if you plot p as a function of rho you should get the same equation whichever ensemble you use okay this is our test for p of rho Okay, so now we want to do the same thing, but on a lattice. So I have a line on a lattice. K mers. K mers are particles which occupy. This is my lattice. The particles are rods and they occupy k consecutive positions. So this is one rod. Five, five. But then it's all rods are of same length. The next rod will be here and the next rod could be here and so on. Okay. So the previous problem was where the variable, the position was a continuous variable. Now the variable has become discrete. So I don't do integrals over xi, I do summations over possible values of xi. Okay? And so can, what is the answer when you do on a lattice? I guess the graph will look something like this, but you know we would like to see the exact functional form and does it def depend on k in some way and what? Okay, so we define. We define omega L of Z is equal to partition uh, is equal to summation over N, summation over configurations Z to the power N. Uh, 
And so this is summation over all allowed configuration of rods. The total length of the system is L, and Z is the Z is equal to fugacity per rod. So if there are n rods, I write z to the power n and some overall configurations, and that is my omega. This is the grand partition function for a finite size L. Then I should take the L goes to infinity limit and divide by L, and you know that's the standard all this as before. Okay. Uh, now now I have to do counting. So you know we can go back to the first part, mayor series kind of stuff. But it turns out that there is actually a quicker and efficient way of getting this now, which is, um, let's see how it works. So I guess I know that omega L equal to 1 of Z is equal to omega L equal to 2 of Z is equal to omega K minus 1 of z equal to 1. Because if the length of the system is less than k, you cannot put any particles. It is just 1. But omega l equal to k will be what? Go ahead. I'm just trying to ensure that you understand. Yes. 1 plus z. Very good. Because there is one configuration with nothing and there is one configuration with one rod. What is omega L equal to k plus 1? One plus two z. Because now the k mark, there is only one possible, but it can be slided. And you can write more. Okay. However, I notice that I can write a recursion relation for this. So I look at, look at the long rod and I look at the first side. Either it is occupied or it is not occupied. If it is not occupied, then the rest of the stuff is just omega L minus 1 of Z. And there is a weight 1 attached to this side. Nothing is there. right? Or it may be occupied, but this is the left end. So if it is occupied, it occupies k sites. So the rest will be omega of L minus k of z. But there is one extra rod, so I have to put z. And this is valid for all, for k greater, for L greater than equal to k plus 1. Okay? All right. So now, now I can, you know, if I have a computer, then I don't write a program to count. That is very hard. I just write this recursion equation and let the computer do the recursions. They are much easier. So, so then, then you can easily evaluate omega 100, omega 200. But taking the log is still non-trivial. But now I notice this is a linear difference equation, which is like what you have studied before, but they were called linear differential equations. So what is the point? It's a linear equation. If you have one solution, and you have another solution somehow of these equations, they have more than one solution possible then you can combine the solutions and that's still a solution. Or you can take a solution and multiply it by 7 and that's still another solution. The boundary conditions, of course, will not be satisfied. The boundary conditions satisfy the solution uniquely, if you have enough of them. But as a functional equation, this can have many solutions. But in particular, it can have a solution which is of the form omega LZ is equal to lambda to the power L. Because you just put it in there, all the L's cancel. So, so long as lambda satisfies some equation or the other, this is a solution. Okay? So, where 
is a solution if when um, well I put lambda to the power l here and solve and I cancel uh, l minus k power so I get lambda to the power k is equal to lambda to the power k minus 1 plus z. Okay, so that's my equation. Lambda is actually the partition function per site in my problem. So that's what I want to determine. That's the solution of this polynomial equation. Okay, so, so we can solve this equation and uh, that determines lambda is a function of z if z is very small then lambda is equal to 1 plus z lambda is roughly 1 at z equal to 0 lambda is 1 when z is small lambda is 1 plus a little bit of z and then you can check what is the coefficient and you know work it out like that. So lambda can be expanded now. Given this equation, I expand this equation in a Taylor series and then I can determine the coefficient successively. That's much easier than working out the Mayer series because you know that in principle works but the, this is a, we are using some extra information to get it to this form. But even this equation is not very comfortable if you work with large k, k equal to 50. Then this equation is not very nice to handle. And so what we can do is I write lambda is equal to 1 plus epsilon. Okay. And then and this equation becomes lambda to the power k minus lambda minus 1 uh, just one second uh, lambda to the power k minus 1 lambda minus 1 equal to z this is the equation and then I write lambda to the power k minus 1 is equal to exponential epsilon k minus 1. But k is large, so it is roughly equal to epsilon k. And so this equation is epsilon e to the power epsilon k is approximately equal to z for large k. Okay, so this equation I can try to solve. It looks a little bit better than this one. No, I made this approximation. This is one plus epsilon to the power k minus one. Let's um, one plus epsilon to the power k minus one, which is approximately equal to exponential epsilon to the power k minus 1 which gives you that okay so this we erase so now can we solve this equation or can we solve this equation to see the behavior for z uh, lambda is a function of z that's what i wanted to know yes no z is any number it can be 0 to infinity it's a positive real number and we are trying to study the behavior of lambda as a function of z Sorry? No, no, no. If epsilon is small, uh, if k is large, if k is large, then epsilon is small. Epsilon. Oh, maybe let let me not say this. Uh, so let's look at this equation. It's the same, but let us look at this equation as a lambda is a function of z. And you know, if I take its derivative, I get the density as a function of z. So what does that look like? 
So lambda is a function of z for large z. Lambda goes like 1 plus z for z goes to 0. And it goes like z to the power 1 by k for z goes to infinity. Because lambda to the power k is sort of like z. Okay, so this part is very good. And lambda goes like z to the power 1 by k implies that rho goes like d log z d by dz of lambda uh, log lambda will be 1 by k for large z. So if z is very large, activity is very large, you want to put as many particles as possible, the maximum possible density is 1 by k, perfectly reasonable. It's just checking that whatever we did, we are not making any mistake. So rho as a function of z here, kind of does this, goes to 1 by k. But it's usually nice to know a little bit more about this function than just the asymptotic values. So what can one say about the behavior in this region? So basically what one can prove, and I will only state, or you can derive it from this equation, near z equal to 0, lambda of z, is a nice analytic function of z. Of course, this is, as a complex function of z, this has, it's a polynomial equation, it's a k roots, right? So each of the k roots is actually an analytic function of z, but it may have branch points or some singularity somewhere else, local, locally analytic function of z, and uh, there'll be some, the solution which is 1 at z equal to 0 is the one we are looking at, that is the branch of interest. And that branch for large z goes like this. Okay? But this function is very interesting. For large z, it has an interesting behavior. Okay? So what is the behavior for large z? This is the question we are asking. So, what I want to do, so what is behavior of lambda z for large z? Is the question. And the first answer is that lambda goes like z to the power 1 by k, which is correct. But then you can ask for, you know, improvements to this answer, correction, correction terms to this behavior. And uh, let us see. So this is what I did here. So I write, write. Now we have taken lambda to be z large. Uh, z is large. Then so I chose some I wrote wrote out the solution, but it is in some units, and I'm trying to change the notation in midway. And I guess that is not a good idea. So let us stick to the notation as in my notes. So we will, um, z large and k large, that is the kind of in, in situation we are interested in. And I want to write this equation, epsilon exponential of k epsilon equal to z. And I want to solve this equation. Okay, for large z. 
Uh, so, as we said, that to the first approximation, you can write exponential of k epsilon is like log is z, or k epsilon is like log z, and epsilon is log z by k. Okay, that is the leading behavior. But then I should write, you know, here z by epsilon and z by epsilon. So this will be log z by k minus log epsilon by k. But epsilon is log z. So this term is actually log log z. And then you write the next correction term to this one. Yes, so, so suppose you say epsilon is equal to log z minus log log z plus terms which are so smaller in size. What is that term? What is the next subleading behavior? So it turns out that that will be log, log, log of z keeps on going like that you just get log 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 yes it's not visible okay very good i will come back here on this side Okay, so we were solving this equation, lambda to the power k into 1 minus 1 by lambda is equal to z. Okay, this is my equation and I want to study the behavior for large z. So for large z, So first I say when z is large, lambda is large, then I can neglect this, then I get lambda is equal to z to the power 1 by k, okay? But then uh, I write lambda is equal to z to the power 1 by k into b. So b is a little bit different than 1. How different is it? So that's what we want to determine. So I will get b to the power k into sorry, this one, yeah. So uh, if I drop the term corresponding to z here in the 1 by lambda here, then I get this solution. But now I want to keep this correction term and see what happens. And um, so the way it's in my notes and I'm not able to do algebra st um, staining here on the dias. Um, so the answer is that you write lambda is equal to e to the power epsilon and I want to write epsilon as a function of z and it is equal to log z by k, this is the first term. But then there is a term which is log, log z, which is, is the next correction is log log z and next correction is log 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 z and it keeps on going like that. Very strange function. You have not encountered, I suspect a large number of you have not encountered such a function before. Okay? So, but of course, this function has been encountered 
in many contexts at many times. So people gave it a name. It is called Langdon function. So it is said that if there is a function w e to the part w equal to z, this equation has a solution where w is equal to solution is w of z and it has this behavior. So then I don't want to, when I want to solve some problem later and I will have all these things, I don't want to expand in powers of log z or some this thing, I'll expand in powers of w of z. Then the first term gives you the answer at this level. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, so there is a long article by Knuth about the beauty of this solution <laughs> and, uh, you know, properties of this Langdon function, but we will leave it for people in aficionados of special functions and computer science. We will just say, okay, there is a solution which is called Langdon function, which has this kind of behavior. Okay, so now what can we do beyond this? So what we would like to do is high density expansion instead. For um, in in e lattice case. So I don't know. This is next neighbor exclusion. This is the one we studied in the first one. Okay. So we have this lattice gas where this particle is there, these are not allowed. But now I want to do a high density expansion. Instead of low density, when z is very large, then how does it behave? Okay. So the answer you can guess is that it perfect when z is infinite then all sites are occupied in one sublattice and all sites in the other sublattice are empty and then what i want to do for large but finite z is to take vacancies as my particles and there is a, what is a high dense gas of particles is a dilute gas of vacancies so i will write a mere expansion for vacancies instead of mere expansion for particles. Okay, so let us try to do that. So I still take the, so this is my, in my same system, omega by omega z. Now, uh, z to the power L squared by 2. This is the leading term for large z. This is the term in which half the particles are full and others are not there. And I guess if I'm very careful, there is a coefficient 2 in front. But then, then there is a Because the, this thing is a polynomial. This is the highest term, this is the next lower, and so on. And there are coefficients, of course, which I'm not writing. Okay? So can we write the first coefficient here? So I can have everything full, or I can have one whole. Okay? So this thing kind of works, but it turns out that it's much more efficient to do a slightly more sophisticated summation of configurations. And what we will do is we will define omega ZA, ZB. ZA is the activity for 
particle on each side. And Z B is equal to particle on B side. And here the lattice is written as A B A B. Like that, A and B sub lattice. And now let me say that we will give unequal, let us consider Z A not equal to Z B. In fact, I will put Zb equal to 0. You cannot occupy particles on the B sub lattice. Then the problem is easy because on the A sub lattice, all sides can be independently occupied. So, omega L by L Za Zb equal to 0 is equal to 1 plus Za to the power number of sides that is going to be L squared by 2 and now I will write this uh, now I can expand this in powers of Zb this full function so Zb equal to 0 is this and this thing will be 1 plus Zb plus Zb squared plus Zb cubed So, we write expanding in powers of xb in zb fixed za. Eventually, we will put zb equal to za, that is our aim, but we will expand in powers of zb. So, now I want to calculate this term zb. Uh, you just put one particle in B side. So, all the A sides are either occupied or empty, you know, they can be anything. This is one, they occur with different weights like that. And now I am looking at configurations where one B side is occupied. This is a B side. But if this B site is occupied, then the four A sites neighboring have to be empty. So I will not allow all possible configuration of A sites, only con subset of A sites where all those four sites are empty will be mm, giving weight. So that is going to be 1 upon 1 plus Z A to the power 4 because four sides have to be empty, they occur with this weight. And then how many such Zb are there? L squared by 2. So this is working. Then I can go to two defects. Again, if they are far, they will just multiply the same term squared. But if they are nearby, then I get a different count. So if I take this occupied and this B site also occupied, then these six sites have to be empty. So I will put 1 upon Z A to the power 6. And so that will give um, some power of uh, Z A to 1 upon Z A to the power 6. So even if I put Zb equal to Za, I lose one extra power of one extra power of Z in the second term and then in the third term and fourth term. So you can each of these terms will involve some functions of Za, which term by term I can work out, and then I mm, take the log of this log of oh this is a very big Z. The partition, these are activities L cross L is equal to L squared log 1 plus Z A by 2 plus here you will get Z B over let us write it as F 0 
of ZA. This is when once you occupy this site and the whatever is the corresponding weight in ZA, plus there will be a ZB squared and there will be some F00, zero zero, which is you put two B sites like this and whatever is the corresponding multiplicative factor you work out and I guess there will be also some term like this ZB squared F you put a B here and then you put another B at distance 1 okay and um, so there is a series expansion you can develop in powers of 1 by Z and if Z is big then this series converges and you have an answer which is this but you can calculate corrections. So if z is 50 and not infinite, you actually get a pretty good estimate of the correct answer by doing this series expansions to finite number of terms. Okay, now, ah, very good, so we have 8 minutes, okay. So now we have the general technique of low density expansions and high density expansions and I can use it for my favorite problem at any given time. So let us say the lattice looks like this as before but my particles look like this, they are crosses. Each particle looks like this. And I want to form, uh, you know, I want to study what happens in this system. So what happens in this system at very high density? Well, you can pack the full space with these objects in an arrangement which kind of looks like this. And so on, you get the idea, okay. So I can pack it fully, that is the maximum packing state and then I can develop high density expansions around this as before and they will work out. Uh, so what is this fully packed state? That is a state which breaks translational symmetry because now if I look at one configuration of the full stuff, then it will have the centers of all the particles will be on one sublattice and not on every possible site. This sublattice is a sublattice of the full system with the unit cell 2, 2, 2, minus 1. You know, you start with the lattice, make multiples of um, E1 equal to 2, 1 and E2 is equal to minus 1, 2 and integer multiples of these and occupy all of them, you get 1. But you can shift this by 1 unit and you get a different arrangement. So how many different arrangements are there total? How many distinct ground states of the full system? Well, the unit cell is in volume 5. Each part, so there are at least 5 different things. But actually you can see that when I form this, you can either go in this direction or you can go in this direction, okay. So there are actually 10, there are 10 distinct ground states. So when you consider the system under disorder, then you will have pockets of the other 9 possible sub, sub lattices inside this one 
and then we have to worry about them. So there is a general um, Pirigovsinite theory, it's just a name, don't worry about the name. What it says is that if I have a system which is ordered, then I, and it has a discrete symmetry, then you look at how many ground states it has. And the number of distinct ground states kind of tells you what is the order of the transition. If all the ground states are, the ground states are obviously equivalent. Uh, so in Ising model, there are two ground states. And it corresponds to Q equal to two parts model. And the transition is dependent on that. If you have some other system, like you have hard hexagons on a triangular lattice, then they form a lattice, but it has a um, three by three, it has a threefold degenerate ground state. And so then it corresponds to Q equal to three Potts model universality class. And this one will correspond to Q equal to 10. Okay. Uh, okay, very good. What we were planning to do, okay, I still, my watch is slower than this one. Oh, this is five minutes before, no? So, okay, anyways. So I had planned to do a little bit more. So let me do this. So this part is okay, this one can be done. So some stuff like this can be studied using high density expansions. high density state of this can be studied using high density expansion because they converge and you know you are it's it's however suppose we consider a system which is simpler apparently than this one where the particles look like squares two by two squares so each particle looks like this. We put them on a square lattice. And what happens to this system? That is the question. So we decide that at low density, it looks like a non-ideal gas. I can discuss the deviation from the P equal to rho KT behavior by doing the virial expansion, Mayer expansion. It will give me various terms. I can determine order by order terms. No problem. If I want to do the high density expansion, what will I do? So now I have to write high density expansion. So Z is large. So if Z is large, omega of L cross L Z will be Z to the power L squared by four because now one out of four sites is occupied in the maximum packed state. I guess there are four such states plus. So now I expect that the next power is L squared by four minus one. And then there is a L squared by four minus two. So I would like to write it as z to the power l squared by 4, 1 plus 1 by z plus 1 by z squared. And uh, you know, mm, that's the way I would like to go. But now I let us evaluate this term, 1 by z term, which is easy. And let me convince you that here the answer is actually l cubed. So what happens is you have this f 
fully packed squares. But I remove one square. So how many ways can I remove this? Uh, one big square, the one two by two square. So four squares. I remove one big square, and then I can do it in L places, N places. So the answer is proportional to N. No. What I can do, once I remove this square, this thing can be slided into a configuration which looks like this. So a square we removed becomes a vacancy. A vacancy breaks into two half vacancies. And these half vacancies can move apart. And this kind of, so the, there are possi L possible configurations for this half vacancy and L possible configurations for this half vacancy. There are L squared configurations for the half vacancies and they can occur on L rows. So that's L cubed. And of course, instead of rows, I could have done it in the, in the column direction. And they'll also give me L cubed. So finally, the answer is L cubed by Z. And uh, I don't want to work at higher orders. So plus. And now I take the log of this. This doesn't cause any problem. It gives you L squared by 4 log Z. That is, as we expected, it gives you 1 by 4 packing. But what is the first correction term? First correction term is not extensive. It's not proportional to L squared. The whole thing is breaking down. OK? So what do we do? How do we fix this problem? So that problem will be fixed in the next lecture. OK? So. OK, so let me stop here. Uh, I guess we should allow you to ask a few questions. So do you know for sure that when you have uh, that five-fold or ten-fold stuff that the system is described by a Ten state pots model, or is it a ten state? Ten it is a speculation. Block? It is a base. It's an educated guess. I think the problem has not been studied in great detail. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you do, you can work out low order terms, and they all converge. They are, there is no breakdown of the um, cumulant expansion. And, and they agree with the ten. They agree with the pots model. Yeah, pots model gives a first order transition for all q bigger than four. So they, then, you know, there's not much, not much to check. Presumably, this model also has a first order transition. But, but there must be many models that have ten, 10 states. So just. So it will be hard to, you know, what check will I make? The check I can make from Monte Carlo will tell me, presumably, that this thing undergoes a first order transition. But that's not enough to, to be sure that it's the, exactly a POTS model, right? I mean, maybe it's. Mm -hmm. So the low density state, OK, it's not exact. No, no, no. OK, maybe I should have said 10 state models in the generalized POTS model class because it doesn't have POTS symmetry necessarily. But there are 10 distinct phases. And they are, the phases are equivalent, but the um, islands of B in A need not be the same as islands of C in A. Uh, no other questions, so let's uh, break for coffee. Okay.